and recordings in progress, by the way. Uh, <laughs> where it's, I think a lot of the the apprehension around AI right now is the work that was that's kind of just been taken by scouring the internet and being and creating the these uh um what's being used to teach the AI versus actually hiring people to build these learning um the the groups of where you're learning from all the all this information uh that's the to me that's the biggest apprehension. I'm most concerned with concept artists dealing with with AI generation. I don't see it really affecting animators as much, um, game design as much right now, anyway. Uh, but like, I, I mentor uh, an illustrator, and she's going into to concept art, um, and she's really, really, really good at characters. Um, she's not as strong in doing environment pieces. So using AI to build a starting point where she can do a paint over, I think is good. Um, we've also worked with uh, myself and another colleague. We we both teach character modeling. Well, all of our character modelers aren't the best two D artists, so we've integrated using AI to kind of build their concepts where maybe they're not able to draw as well, or at least they they start as a a, a starting point um, and being able to build upon that. I think right now we have to be very careful um, about what AI is because it feels like it changes on almost a daily basis. Uh, and then not be scared of it and be like, well, we don't, we don't even want to introduce or talk about it because it's, it's here and students need to know about it. We all need to know about it. Uh, and if you can integrate it in some manner into your classes, that helps with, uh, with our comfortability and students not being apprehensive of, oh, I just wasted however many years getting this degree that now I can't even use, uh, which I don't think will be the case. Well, I'm not, I'm not a teacher or anything. I'm, I'm an illustrator mm -hmm. and I'm a digital painter. I've been digital painting for 30 something years. My problem with it is that, okay, if you're saying that this, if a 2D person, if they can't draw that well and you're going to use the AI to help their stuff look better. But well, what's the point in teaching them how to do anything if you can just use AI to do whatever they need to do that they're not learning how to do or they're not good at doing? So how does that work out? Now, when you said that, my first thought was, well, then how will they ever know if they're good enough? Or maybe it's, will they ever have to get good enough to just be able to paint or draw? So what's the, pur what's the purpose of going to art school? Which I 100% agree with you on that one. On my example that I was giving, these are for 3D artists that got into 3D because they're not good at 2D. Um, I'll raise my hand on that one. Uh, I can draw well enough in 2D to pass, but not well enough to compete. Um, and that's where I think it's beneficial for um, those type of students. Uh, the illustrator, I think she, in, in that example that I'm using on that is, she wants to be character. She wants to be character, but a weak part of her is, is doing environments while she still works on it. Uh, I think if you used it as a starting point to do paint overs, I mean, right now, AI is really just very advanced photo bashing. Well, we've, we've done that for a long time where we'll take Photoshop or we'll grab a frame from a film and go, I'm not going to steal it, but for concept right now, that gives me the foggy jungle mm -hmm. and I'm going to learn by doing a paint over how to paint that myself. But right now, it'll help me more quickly approximate it. And then I put my character into that temporary yeah. background and stuff. So we've been doing that stuff on our own where we've been doing the scraping, where I'll go like, I want to be influenced by Henry Clay. I want to be influenced, and I, and I really try to mimic him. So I'm, I'm doing my own scraping. So, but now do you have something that can instantly do that? Uh, I think a big change that everybody should think about, uh, I talked with uh, Richard Atkinson, who's president of the CDSA. Mm -hmm. And so they, they deal with all of the studios that are out there. And he, in the last summit that we had earlier this year, announced that, even though there was a little bit of a stumble with Web3 and blockchain and, you know, with cryptocurrency and people kind of doubting it, he said, you know, it is coming. And Web3 with Blockchain Foundation will be the first time it's a secure space from the ground up. And so at that point, tagging things that are scraped, um, just blocking out deep fakes, stuff like that, all that can happen. So the first time, if even with AI doing like the big scrape, you'll be able to tag everything know where it came from, give attribution, yep. give, give payment. <laughs> um, 
So it can become a canvas that people choose to be in or not. And somebody else was decrying last night, like, well, it scraped everything so much with millions of pieces of art that it's kind of looking the same now and they've run out of things to scrape. <laughs> so I said, okay, but in the brave new future where it's authenticated and everybody gets attribution, uh, now it's good news that it ran out of things to scrape because I can be the artist that does the unique new thing that people will want that to scrape. Good. So I become the shiny object and I charge to go in and be scraped. So, <laughs> uh, Nye, did you have any introductory uh, comments that you wanted to make? Well, it's so many things have already been said in the first 10 minutes. We've already gone from AI to Web3. Um, I want to go back <laughs> to your first question and then hit a couple other things. I think you um, you asked, what is AI? And I think the thing that I'm kind of most focused in on is what is automation? And what does it mean to do something once or twice and then have it done infinitely amount of times? The ability to scale very rapidly, the ability to, to reduce the amount of labor that it takes to do something uh, is gonna plummet. And so, um, so the question of like, what are you gonna teach? I think it's less of like, hey, I need a big studio with hundreds and hundreds of people. And it's more of like small collections of people can be able to accomplish a lot. They can scale very, very rapidly. Um, like one of the things that we try to teach is process like once. So for example, if you have like a ZBrush class and you're doing a character, you wanna make sure that you do like the topology and the one another so they understand all of these concepts. And at the end, they're like, oh yeah, I remember we did all that over the last six weeks where we're gonna push this button and it's gonna go whoop, 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 and it's gonna take care of everything we just did, but at least you've gone through and you conceptually understood that. Um, so that's kind of how we're we're approaching it. Um, and on the web three thing, I think you're hundred percent right on the, the, the uh, prominence kind of thing. If we can start tracking, Right now, I'm not super big on blockchains. I haven't really seen anything that has that has gone, but I do agree that like Adobe Firefly has started tracking things. And um, so I don't really quite understand that tech, but I believe it's probably coming. And that's probably gonna be how we're gonna we're gonna fix that. So that was my response. First <laughs> 12 minutes, pretty uh pretty fast moving stuff. I think Tom has a comment. I just want to get in um, also, I'm Tom Cito, I'm a professor at the University of Southern California and longtime animator and former president of the Animation Guild. Uh, just speaking from the labor point of view, uh, I've seen enough uh, in, in, in my 48 years <laughs> in animation to, uh, to see new technologies come. And, and every new technology, I mean, I remember back in the 80s when people were saying computers are coming. Computers are coming, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and the people before us were like televisions coming, televisions coming, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like there's always a there's always a, a new thing. And the problem is every time there's a new thing, there's always a whole class of executives who rub their hands gleefully and go, who can we get rid of now? <laughs> like how many people can we fire? <laughs> you know, and, you know, and the pro you know, I mean, actually, it's funny. Um, there was a thing with um, um, uh, Ken Anderson that when the Xerox process was was invented for xerography, Ken walked into the uh, uh, ink and paint building and looked and said to the inkers, "Isn't this great? We've got something now. We won't need any of you." <laughs> like tactful, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but but you know, but the interesting thing is, even with that and stuff, you know, it still finds its level. You, you, you know, because a, a big pitch for, for for CGI in the 80s was that you're going to use less artists and it's going to use less labor and all. And have you ever looked at the screen credits on a big movie now? They look like Roman legions going by names. I was on, I was on the first Tron. Yeah. So Bill and I were the two computer image choreographers on the first Tron. The Academy thought we pushed a button and that film came out. <laughs> we didn't even have a start the light cycle here, make it go there, interpolate. Yeah. We didn't even have that. We had give an object an address for one frame. Mm -hmm. So we had to write the address for every freaking frame. So it was such a handcrafted movie. And the industry thought you pushed a button, it happened, you're cheating. Um, I had a lot of my friends, except John Lasseter came and started looking over my shoulder. He, yeah. he was very intrigued by it at the time. But um, a lot of people thought it was a similar moment where it was gonna rob people and yeah. cheat. Lisberger, who directed the movie, it was very interesting. I heard him talk recently at one of our get togethers for the film. And he said, at the time, just in society, computers were looked at 
as a dangerous thing. Yeah. It's yeah. like the military is going to use it to take over and like how in 2001 is like the future and stuff. And so he said, what if I take a group of artists right now when computers are still being invented? It's like the early days of making them. And I have a group of artists secretly turn a bunch of the technology into their channel of what they want to get done as artists. And we like fund it through a movie getting made. And they change the history of what computers even are while we make a movie. And so he had this undercurrent of like, let the artists get their hands on it. Don't think of it as just a military thing. What will they do? And so I feel a similar moment that as soon as we get security taken care of so many facets, what is AI? Like I'm right now doing authoring of conversational characters. We started that at R&D back in like 2015. And I spend so many hours authoring the backstory and the personality and the bios and all the stuff, the characters, and then having hours of conversation with them. To me, AI is, is it's bringing alive the writer in me and the director in me because I can sit with the creation I just made and have conversations and they go, no, I want your memory to be a little different. And I can go in and write their memory a little differently and stuff. So to me, that's also AI that I'm shaping. It's like the computer isn't telling me what to do. I am spending hours and hours not only writing and authoring, but having conversations with my own creation and shaping it before I put it in front of other people. So that's also a, like a whole different facet of what it even is. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's just as an example that, uh, you know, I teach a storyboard class. And and uh, last um, last spring, uh, um, I had a student who jumped into AI when when you know first got the opportunity, and and uh, you know I gave him a, an assignment to do you know storyboard. Usually I take a speech from a play or something, and I, yeah. you know and uh, you know, spell it out like a movie. And, and and what he did is that he roughed out his sketches, like he roughed out his shots, like he roughed out the way he wanted to see it, close ups, long shots, and all. But then he told the AI. Render this in the style of NCYF, mm -hmm. uh, a nighttime with a blue monotone. Mm -hmm. And it did it. It did all the panels and mm -hmm. everything like that. And I got to say, they were, you know, but the good thing was, was that they were still his shots. Like he still, he still decided mm -hmm. this is a close up. This is a long shot. This is a pan, whatever, you know. And it's just the rendering part was the one that was. But the, it's the, the fun done. part. The and, fun and, part. <laughs> I'm sorry. The sure. part is to render. Mm -hmm. That's where I get my my joy. Yeah, is when I'm painting. I, I'm an illustrator. I'm I'm not. I'm an illustrator. I was at Disney Publishing for thirty yeah. years, mm -hmm. and I painted all the books based on Pixar, did whatever. Yeah, and I was their first digital artist, publishing for Emma Floyd, mm -hmm. and she also worked in publishing for a while. And 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 I had to bring them along because they were like computers. They don't know what they do. So I was on Photoshop from the very beginning. Yeah, and and at the cool. And for me. The more that Photoshop changed, the more, again, the technology, the more it changed, the more I could do with it. But at the same time, my joy is painting in the computer. I don't want someone to render. I don't want someone to push a button and all of a sudden what I want to do it becomes that. So for me, it, I feel like it, would, it, would, it wouldn't be fun for me. Yeah. That's just me. I'm an old woman, so maybe it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, but I, 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 I could see someone else who's not good at painting and goes, yeah. my joy is storytelling. Yeah. yeah. So if they pay you to train the system to paint in your style, they go, I love the way Adrian paints. They pay me? My dream. <laughs> yeah, they pay you. So they, they pay you to have it do it what Tom described. Yeah. And it looks at the end like you did all their illustrations, but you get paid for it. But I also do the paint. I know we've done it far, yeah. but like, you said you have to Because I lost my job, so I don't have to do it. And I don't really care right now. But um, but I was I was a digital for many years. But so I was five years for five. I was five. I'm not I'm not a person. Okay. By the way, I I recently got these like fifteen hundred at a time, literally. Um, mid journey shots, Dolly three, and it person that's working on a project that I'm associated with. And it's very customized. We're asking for, for them to explore story, subject matter, and everything. But what invariably happens is out of that 1,500, I'll find maybe four or five that kind of work for the story that we're trying to make. And then I do paint overs, and then it works better. And then I do like six or seven really rough sketches that show them the story beat, and they go, oh, there it is. So it worked as uh, like fantastic images, but shaping it for a story comes back to an individual touching it, messing with it, and actually I mean, going very simple. 
have yeah. worked in that school as well. Obviously, yeah. that's a of time. And yeah. I think it'll, because what we've done, we do stuff in Disney, yeah. and we don't necessarily like the way it looks, so we change it yeah. to make it what we want it to be. Yeah. So I just didn't know there was a name for it. I just, yeah. I just kind well, of. Well, and, <laughs> and by the way, for any of you who haven't seen her stuff, it's gorgeous. It is. It is. That's what you get. I'm not too old to not learn something new. I, I love it. But I was just curious about that aspect for me because yeah. that's my favorite part. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I was thinking about um, uh, there was a guy named Peter Greenwood who's passed away, unfortunately. But uh, he was an Australian uh, film historian, and and uh, he was talking about we were talking about the evolution of computer graphics, and he he remembered he was at ILM when when uh, uh, Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan uh, was done with the Genesis effect. Mm. And that was like a very, you know, it was like all the all the engineers or like all the tech people of Pixar were then the Lucasfilm graphics group and everything. And, and you know, Alvy Ray and Smith and all those guys, all, all Cat Malt, they all decided to do this, this uh, demonstration of what computer graphics was capable of. And the traditional uh, ILM artists were looking at Scott's though, like, like, oh, these guys are going to like, Put us out of work, you know, like that. And uh, Pete was saying that that uh, when they watched Star Trek II, uh, you know, the small theater they had, uh, ILM had in San Rafael, there was like, you know, uh, everybody was all excited. It's this beautiful sequence and everything. And and uh, they gave out free posters and and, everything. and they said the the a number of the traditional an, uh, uh, artists uh, uh, would take the poster and as they left the lobby, they would stuff it in the garbage pail. <laughs> go, That's it. That, that there's our friggin' uh -huh. jobs go, you know. But you know they're all working. Everybody's working. You know, it, you know it's still you know you're retrained and all. So and then every every technology has displacement. It's so there's always some. But you know we're all still here. Are you gonna ask something? Yeah. I teach for three months at the bar. So this this conversation, when I think of what it means to teach, mm -hmm. right? There's a there's a craft and a skill, right? But there's also a thought process. We're trying to always get students who we're teaching to unlock their brain. The old term, are you a hot pen? A hot pen would be the person would be asking questions to solve problems, right? Big distinction. We're trying to find a way. So, to harness both of those. So I'm looking at AI and I'm going, where does AI interface with that? Where does it pull from one or pull from the other or add or add to one to another? Um, where does that look? It's very easy for people who are tactile, right? To go, I can find the shortcut. They don't need there are folks within certain processes where you didn't fight against. So how do you teach? How do you know when it's the right time to allow that process to be a part of the game? Well, when you go, I don't really need that. That's not something you need to be part of the process today. Where is that? Or is that even a thing? So I, <laughs> uh, I get a accused by my students of I always teach the hard way first <laughs> and then I'll teach them all the shortcuts and they're just like why didn't you teach us that before and I say if I only teach you how to the shortcut to get someplace or oh you can only know how to follow a GPS but you can't read a map what happens if your GPS fails uh, so I think we still need to have we still have to teach the foundation we still have to teach what's a good shot what's a bad shot what's good topology I remember um, brought up earlier if you don't understand that, then yeah, they can AI create a bunch of images all they want and they won't recognize that it's bad. They'll put that in the portfolio and then anyone that's looking at it is like, well, what is this? Uh, I do share the same concern of like a lowering of the bar, um, kind of where now all of us think that all these photographs look great, but if you take our phone camera and put it next to a professional camera, it's a joke. <laughs> But everyone feels like, oh, well, that's a good shot because yeah. we, we've we've mm -hmm. kind of lowered our standard in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, it's you know, we were talking about or you were talking about scraping earlier. Mm -hmm. My concern is like a multiplicity problem where Michael Keaton, you had a copy of a copy. It's not mm -hmm. as good as the original. 
that's my biggest concern is that uh, things will start low, like the bar will lower so much. There was like, oh yeah, that's good enough. Um, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that right now. There's the concept that you're talking about now, yes, our movies will get lesser. Yeah. We'll probably invent something new. And also in terms of the teaching, I think we can see teaching always think about project, creating things. Sorry. Now we can't hear him. Oh, yeah. Eric was. Did you drop off? Nine, did we lose you? It's nine. There you are. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Oh. How much yeah, did you, you lose? Nine. Hello? Yeah, yeah, we hear, we hear you. <laughs> I'll stop. I don't know how much I. I... Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Can you say what you just said one more time? Uh, which part? Oh, I, well, I was talking about, I lost my, my, my rhythm, but um, I think that automation will make knowledge very sort of available, but projects are still very relevant. So if you're working with your students, hey, we're making a project and we're going to problem solve towards that end. And, you, and that, that is an art that still needs to be practiced and worked on. Um, and AI, I think, will also give us opportunities to make new things like procedural narratives or things like that that have yet to kind of barely been explored that I think that the content will probably evolve. But yeah, the photography and the movies and things like that will probably become more generic because everybody can do it. That's my guess. But there's a, you know, there's a way in teaching students to keep things very much individual and expressing a specific character of thought, story beat. Um, we were talking about, for instance, both with performance capture for a character that would be in a game or for autonomous free walking robotics, we would do exercises where it wasn't time saving, it was opening a new thing we couldn't do before. So we'd say, well, how is this robot going to express? So my challenge was before we start even building it, instead of going for range of motion, we do range of emotion. So we do I wrote a story, we brought in somebody in performance capture suit, they went through all these different emotions and boy, the engineers saw like, oh my God, the shoulder has to move that way. Well, yeah, when they're pissed off, it does. Or they're so sad and they're just doing a subtle little movement. It's like, usually the servo doesn't have to do something that subtle, but now it does because of emotion. So you'd have range of emotion. Now the people would even build the thing. And then we would use AI to say, now that, now that it's capable of that and we have it expressing it, now can it procedurally take a new path right now because I'm asking it to follow me, but it happens to be in a sad mood. So can it do the universal pantomime that I understand for that character and to make it character specific? So it's not just what a person would do when they're sad. It's like what Winnie the Pooh would do when he's sad or what Ray from Star Wars would do when she's sad, like to have it be underlined the specificity of the eccentric one and then to be expressed procedurally in real time through AI. And it's not cheating or saving time. It's just, we couldn't do that before. We couldn't say, stay in character and improvise. But when we all work to build it so that it's only scraping from its own personality, it's like, it's not reaching outside the scrape. And I'll just mention one other business thing. Um, we, you know, we deal with that when we deal with iconic characters, keep them in their lane. But I had a business guy years ago, he's still in touch with me who wanted a virtual duplicate of himself and he wanted an AI trainer and it was to expand him because he, he was a nutritionist, he was a physical fitness guy, he was proud of his physique and he wanted it to be photo real of him and he wanted it to train more of the people he had clients that were doing physical fitness stuff and nutrition. So he wanted them to openly know like, this is my AI duplicate, it's my voice, it's me, so you're familiar with it, I'm there with you wherever you are, and I, yes, I'm busy with uh, like some star getting them ready for a movie, but I'm still available for you too. Um, he specifically told us the same thing that like Disney would tell us about an iconic character. He said, for my business, I don't want you doing any Google search and scraping of information to come in that my character says. I want it only to come from my books. This is what I teach and train. I went to school for years to learn this stuff. I tried it. So I want only my teachings to come out of my character and, and his gestures. So it's scraping, but it's only scraping from him. And so it stays 100% who he is. And, uh, you know, that's fights generic, 
It's, it's the opposite of generic, it's individual. And so I think AI, when it's deployed by students to express their individuality, they can find it a way to amplify and to open up new canvases for them, um, then it's a big help. I, I wanted to check to see if there was anybody that was coming in via Zoom that had a comment or a question. Is there anybody coming in remotely that wants can to say hear, anything? Can anybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, hi. Nice to see you all from afar. Um, I can. I'm catching about eighty percent of what's said. The mics aren't that great there, but uh, you know, I think that to have a discussion about AI in general is already kind of a, the ship has left the dock on it. You know, because AI or machine learning has been affecting us for years and years, and it's just going to get more and more impactful. And a lot of it's already invisible. You know, as as an analogy, I point to what we used to call tracking in scenes and CG where you had to track a 3D environment. And we used to have people do that by hand and then they got better and better tools, but eventually it got so good that it became completely automated. And you could call that an AI process because all you would do is ask the scene to be tracked and the machine would do it for you. You wouldn't have to do any rudimentary tools. And we're seeing that happen already in so many functions. You know, it, the idea of pulling mats and green screens and stuff, that'll all be what you might call AI, because that'll just be the machine will know how to do that. And you can direct it selectively to do that. And so where does that stop? You know, when you start to have processes that become increasingly automated automatically by the machine, you have to, you can identify that as AI and we'll all welcome that, you know, because generally those start out to be the most mundane things that are best replaceable by a machine that don't take creative work. But it's going to start invading every aspect of creativity. What Jerry just said about intelligently creating a character by feeding that character uh, personality, that's already happening with rigging where you're making a character move according to the way that character is predefined. So think about that as an animator. You know, you've already defined a lot of the motion already. So when it comes time to do a scene, this will be, this is already happening. We all know it. It happened in Massive. It's happening in games. You know, the character is already pre-programmed to animate. So is that animation or not? If an animator is no longer uh, technically interacting with a scene, yet the character, an artificial character is moving with complete personality that's preordained, that's, that's, a, that's here. That's why I think we're having to have this big discussion in the academy about what is now, what is animation? Because uh, we can't ignore these tools, you know? There's never been a technology that has been inherently evil. You know, we all feared mocap, but mocap is not evil you know there is no technology that's inherently evil the way you use it can be evil but the technology itself is not evil and so i think that the one discussion that's really relevant about ai is not ai in general because it will be coming everywhere and it will be helping us all and we'll all be happy to have it it's gonna you have to talk about precise very precise applications of ai to have any kind of debate and Right now, I think that those precise applications only have to come into this aspect of, is there a point where it's stolen or copied and not genuine, you know, from the original source? That seems to be, in a way, the one really pertinent thing to be aware of and to be alert for and to have, and eventually perhaps create rules about. Otherwise, I think that uh, maybe Katzenberg was on the money when he said that production is going to go down a lot because AI is going to help out. And what, is that a bad thing? Again, we all fear technology losing jobs, but I don't think people were really that afraid when all those really skilled guys putting horseshoes on horses ran out of work when the cars came along. So, uh, and I just want to say for the audience, if you don't know, the person who was just talking made a wonderful film in the 80s called Technological Threat on this very subject, a very yeah. funny cartoon <laughs> where the hand-drawn wolves were against the robots taking over their job. <laughs> That's the technological threat is what we're still talking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> so great film. Awesome.
to me, what they are is those that are starting to come in using AI as their portfolio. Mm -hmm. In other words, we might can't go on, but if someone's trying to come in showing the artwork and then I can break that down. You know, me, I always say, show them how to explain the process. Show them how to show your sketches, show the color, show how them break down. But some developing that for the next couple, you know, three or four years, we're going to be getting portfolios that yeah. they're like, is this, mid, is this a mid journey or not? <laughs> you know, it's one of those tells that we're going to have. And so the interview is going to be even more important like, in the process. So how to get that. It's fun to do. And then they break up the keyboard and they start typing. Um, but the other thing is that they were saying, oh my gosh, we're going to be with Knox. It's been a great story. I was like saying, okay. Business now is the biggest priest, street industry. That's for it's like the internet all over. They're looking for content, looking for content, just to use like what they need. And they can get 200 people, you know, but you all love that part of it. Hey, it's great to have a big, big group until the thing is finished and suddenly have your team is fine. So now you can start generating or creating artwork with the help of AI. You know, that can fill in areas that you're not really good because I know a lot of programmers, I know a lot of artists, but we probably have people that can do programming as well, especially, you know, on the art side. You have to go over to Tom's side and say, hey, when you know how to, how to code for us? And they're like, what? Do you think, well, we don't do anything. <laughs> Computers, AI, it depends. Like I said, I see it more as a tool. It's like, can, can AI fill that tool or that gap that you don't have? Because you don't know someone from the computer side that gets this for, or can well, write shaker for that. So, it seems like it would be nice for boutique size studios exactly that are yes. that are able to produce something final because they have assists. Because Apple, Amazon, all these streaming services are desperate for content. You know, and they're looking for this time. And now we've got streams where you don't understand it. You now do it because you know, they can use yeah. AI. And the point I was getting though was when I asked, you know, have you ever used Mentor or any of the other ones? Sometimes it's just the process of when, well, I have an MFA in illustration. Mm -hmm. I have filled up the whole time. Mm -hmm. But even I was like, the journey, I'll type in thoughts and I'll spit out about four things. And I start with one. Like, what about that? Now, I never use that. I even told my students, you give me something like this and tell me that your work. That's like going to Google, downloading an image to hand it. No, this is your sketch. Then you build up on what it's color, where it's going to be. And so it's fantastic because students will generate artwork and they'll look at it. I never thought about that. Sometimes this generated art is inspirational. I said, you know, that, that's, that's the moment we used to have. I remember when I had to used to, to go to a library. Mm -hmm. And check out books and i would be leafing through for that moment of inspiration of the thing i never thought of that would be exciting and then you know with google opened it up and now mid journeys i could so we're able to do the broader search for the inspiration and as long as we just use it as a way to get up out of our own rut exactly. and then create something like i said it's it's very useful to see and it's also accessible to educate students because one can recognize you know, but also can say, hey, you never thought about this and being done with your path. So, Mike. Uh, yeah, Mike Rivenotti. I'm a professor at East Los Angeles College. And so for me and our students that go on to SCAD, they go on to USC, or some go into trade, um, always a concern is, you know, kind of this digital divide. So if we're scraping things, and yet uh, we're not getting as much information as, as we go through Google, um, I'm curious to see, you know, just how you could facilitate that there. So if I do something, for instance, a Chilean shaman from a certain area, what would Midjourney be able to come up with? Them? Does that sort of make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and then, and then also those students that now are getting, you know, finally able to do mocap or doing a reel. Mm -hmm. I mean, some folks don't have computers. They don't have a cell phone they can use. So that, that's that's a concern. Right? 
Right, that was one of the questions is um, this tool making things uh, more accessible to people or not? You know, it's. I think it's too too early to tell, but mm -hmm. uh, just for you. Mm -hmm. In the short term, I think it is making it more accessible. Um, there's a motion capture stage at SCAD that sits idly because there are three apps now that the students can use with their phones to drop FBXs of their mocap directly into Blender, which is also a free software. Uh, the Unreal Engine is free. There's a lot like, and I think the same thing with these AI tools are gonna proliferate and allow students to be able to do these really magic things. The long-term concern, and I think you're right, you're kind of on it, and I'm, I don't know the solution to this, is that we're using centralized companies' processing power uh, and, and also their data sets, which are sort of re, you know, remote, and we have to, then they're going to be able to, to charge us or license or whatever it is, as opposed to I hope that there'll be a future trend where we will localize some of these tools. Um, and again, I don't know what the solution is on this, that we, if we can try to find ways to control our own data sets and our own models and use, you know, potentially open source, I don't know if that's the right answer or not either. But just sort of getting away from the centralized guys, I think that would give artists more opportunity and also more um, financial opportunity as well. Uh, so I'd like to make a to speak to that point, if I may. I'm John Reed Perkins Buzo, and I'm at uh, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And uh, I've actually been working on, on doing precisely that and mm. building uh, tools that can be localized. And I presented a paper at SIMPTE in 2019 that was precisely talking about, about developing diffusion techniques in a local area. And, and I've been working on that since, since then. I, uh, and uh, awesome. it's it's not it's not an easy thing because you you need lots and lots of uh, data storage to, to build uh, these machine language machine learning data sets. And one thing I wanted to say is because we're relying on Microsoft, who you know owns Chat GPT and Dali three and all, or other these other Google owning uh, Bard and you're getting data sets that are biased, biased and not, not necessarily in a, in a clear, you know, oh, this, this kind of bias or that kind of bias, but it's a corporate bias. It's biased to corporate interests, you know, because they're trying to sell these, these, um, you know, the, the, these uh, properties that they own, they're trying to sell services so that the, it's not a clear cut bias that we can, we can put our finger on, but it is a corporate bias that's very hard to to nail down. So I think I think you're right. We need we need to book more toward developing tools that can be, you know, installed locally, and we can train ourselves. That you can train on your own materials, and uh, that's why you know uh, that robotics discussion that was just a few minutes ago about training the you know the the machine on um, special materials to, for just that project to get the the machine to work in just that way that's kind of wrapped up in the whole thing of doing it locally rather yeah. than relying on these giant corporations and if you can and it's like now we have the the, the technology is not quite there but I try to talk to my students about intellectual property. Like this is a character. Yeah. You created this idea. You should own your data set. And that means you're in, like, legally entitled to what is inside of it. Hopefully the technology will become accessible and we'll be like licensing everything that we create before they go up into data sets. But right now, I don't even think just, you know, 19 year olds are, are, are aware that IP is a thing. And um, you know they're used to labor being an hourly contract of weight rate. Um, so, uh, and since I'm, I've got the mic, I also want to say that I'm really worried about emotional state in my students in general. Um, I think we've outside of AI. I think I've been watching some alarming numbers go up. Um, maybe they're attracted to the game program, 
Um, but I think that AI is accelerating um, some worries and some self-confidence issues and jobs. And, you know, if you're an animator and you've like your dream is to go to Pixar or something and then all of a sudden, oh, hey, it's all automated. Like it's really hard to convince them that there's going to be a new creative route. And so I, I spent a lot of time struggling this um, and I'm very excited about the opportunities with AI, but I feel like right now we also have an emotional thing we got to figure out. Um, yes. Yeah, we have a question here. So we're, we're still at the moment. Somebody who has a broken thing and was less recently than I would like to say it to me, but Frank was actually one of my professors at one and it was a really good class. <laughs> um, that, that was your first mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also somebody who happens to work with a lot of people who are younger coming to the workforce. What I'm noticing a lot of the time is we, especially Gen Z, so I'm kind of on that cusp of Gen Z, a lot of people don't have the confidence to when separated. And so going back to kind of what you were saying earlier, I learned how to animate. I am so happy that I know how to do that. I'm not really more comfortable on traditional media just because that's kind of where I've you know, always kind of gone to. But having this confidence and knowing when to break the rules and what rules are appropriate to break and all of that is such a good tool to have in the back of your pocket. That's what helps with confidence. That's what helps with, you know, Talking to other people and giving opinions because anybody can learn how to draw. Not everybody can learn how to make a decision. So, oh, maybe this is where I go digital. This is where I choose watercolor. This is where maybe AI is cool for me to use it. Um, I don't know if that's something you can really teach, but when you're seeing students make some of those really good decisions, I think that's something to kind of like help boost up and boost up the confidence with because that's how we know. You know, I think that's the big difference maker. If that's mm -hmm. yeah, I'd really like to rip off of that because, like, I, I used to be told, like, yeah, you got to find your confidence. Uh, I teach at LMU in the animation department, and um, you don't really find confidence; you build confidence. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, when this conversation comes up, I see like Dolby I young sixteen year old with me. Like, is there going to be like animation in the future? And um, I'm I'm quick to tell them like they don't really know what the future is going to be like. I think that is like. Definitely a takeaway from this conversation. There will be a lot of AI and use of AI after who will own it and who will have access to it. Like nobody really knows. But if they can spend the next three years or two years like leaning into something that they feel passionate about, whether you know sand animation exists two years from now, they can at least look back and say, that's what mattered to me, and that's what I focused on. I felt the mastery of this thing. Whatever comes next, I'll do the same thing better, whether it's computers or something else. Uh, I, I think it's a really exciting time. I think these tools are very exciting. Um, I can't imagine giant corporations not consolidating these characters and these ideas mm -hmm. and making it a like, I can see myself in Final Draft one day hitting like the Salt Bass button and all my storyboards and just shoot out. <laughs> um, I can't imagine that not happening. I'd love to be part of that somehow, but like being new to the game, like I can kind of see my, my skill set maybe not being able to keep up. And it's only going to get faster and faster and faster. Yeah, but I'm excited. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm Ricardo. I'm a music composer, and you know, actually uh, talking about that, like it's it's about how you use AI. Mm -hmm. I, I've been fortunate enough to work closely with uh, Cardano Foundation and Polygon Labs and so on. I started working with a number of like uh, music related projects, and at a certain point. They asked me to use AI, right, to produce more music. They're like, now we want to produce more music. We want to, mm -hmm. we want to have more stuff. But then at the point, I asked myself, can I use this tool to do something else with it? So what we did was we got involved, like fifteen thousand people. That they sent us music ideas and stems. We mm -hmm. used the AI to produce more stems. But then with my company, we filter all of that in a number of sound checks, and then we credited all those people. Right. To that. So at the point, now I know how to use AI with a community of 15,000 people, and I have a small company, we're like three, four people. And their so fingerprints are in all your work. In all of, so those and are NFTs, and we can credit those people through Spotify and blockchain. So at the point, I was like, okay, now I can use AI and sell this product as musician and music producer and composer to a number of, of uh, 
companies and so on. So I think it's just about finding a sweet spot where you can use AI to something that you want to do and make yourself valuable in that environment. And people are very open to that as well when they understand the tech. I was just going to say there's another experiment. We're still trying to fund the full experiment, but it was trackless vehicles in immersive environments and theme parks with the real-time moving eye point projected around you and stuff like that. But to have interactivity that people can do into it and to have the music. And so we hired a group of composers to say, can you make a whole palette of musical expressions to represent different parts of nature that are awakened around you? And you have no idea if someone is going to make like 10 butterflies fly or a thousand yeah. uh, when they go into the space or whether they're going to make 10 butterflies and then have a bunch of golden fish swimming in the water next to them or something. So as if you have music associated with all of that, and then you want it to harmonize and you want it to surprise people. And so if they create the foundational pieces and then let AI be their com companion composer to implement it procedurally, uh, now we're all working together and it's not robbing them of work. It's giving them a new canvas to paint on with their, with their audio. Awesome. AI needs still a filter anyway right now because yeah. the stamps that we received from AI were like we're far away from usable right for a lot of like different reasons mm -hmm. harmony uh, mixing problems and so on right. so you still for now luckily enough still then a filter that can give or something I'm I'm hoping and going back to students and their confidence and stuff if they can see examples like that where they don't see it as a choice of when do I let the computer do it for me. Mm -hmm. They're thinking of all of it as like, when do I want to tell the computer to do a task for me? And I, I will still control it. And there's all these different ways that I could use it. And if it goes back to, in all cases, I'm trying to tell a story. I'm trying to bring a character alive. I'm trying to create a mood. So it's like, that's the driving force. The tech is always just, what do I pick up to help make this so? And then to see it as their own tools um, that they can use and to, to have them feel like they, they can grab the steering wheel and and either not use it or or steer it. And it's, for me personally, like I grew up, you know, I was born in '96. Mm -hmm. okay? So I, <laughs> baby, but also right in an area where I grew up with technology, mm -hmm. it was an option for me. Right? Yeah. Like I said, I grew up more traditional media, but at the same time, like I know I thought to go yep. to Photoshop, pop it there, mm -hmm. right? well, you know, all that stuff. Yep. It's, it's kind of, you know, either or for me. With a lot of the new generation, again, it's very much, they've always had it. It's always been mm -hmm. right up them, and that's what they use, and that's what they rely on. And so I think it's, it really is just like teaching them the confidence when to make that decision. Uh, you know, how to make that decision is mm -hmm. so important, and, and that will help with confidence and mental health issues going into the mm -hmm. industry and all that. So there can, is a lot of that happening. Yeah, yeah, if I can jump in, it's just too, that uh, just to say that all the universities are are, are being, uh, are having problems right now with student anxiety and depression. Yeah. It's not like just like one particular school or one particular mm -hmm. field. Since the lockdown, there's been, a, you know, we've had seminars and things like that about, about students have come out of the lockdown just kind of like, not looking forward to the future and stuff, you know, not really understanding. And you try to explain, you know, I mean, you know, I hate to be one of those old guys who goes, well, when I was young, <laughs> but when I was young, <laughs> like in the seventies, it was, it was, a, the, the industry was in a downturn, you know, you know, and, and the old folks who were retiring and say, don't get an animation. There's no future in that business. It's dying. Go, let it go. You know? And, and that was what you know, all the old guys were saying that stuff as they were retiring. And uh, well, not for <laughs> but but not Eric Frank or Ollie or well, no, yeah. kind of, but as <laughs> yeah. you said, I was the only one that could do it. <laughs> um, I noticed that there's some a couple of uh, messages in the chat, and I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss those. Okay. I don't know if they're questions or comments, but I thought we should. I was going to say again. When I started digitally painting in '93, when I came to Disney, and and when I got on the computer, it was like my mind was blown when I first saw Photoshop and Painter, and I was like, "This is so cool!" And all of my friends were like, "That's not real art. Whatever it is that you're doing, that's not real art. You need to be painting." But I started traditional, so I started as an artist, 
But when I got on the computer, I realized that what I could do, and I saw it as a tool. I never saw it as that it was something that was whatever. I just saw it as another paintbrush. Yep. Now I'm just using yeah. my, whack of my, my my pen or my stylus, and I'm painting. And the then I think it's now up. pixels. Yes. And so when I got more into Disney and I started to hire people because I started hiring freelancers, and a lot of the young people, they would come to me and say, well, my computer, it'll do it for me. I can just do this. No, no, no. Not with me. I need to know if you actually know yeah. how to paint. Do you understand value? Do you understand color? Do you understand layout? That's all important. Yes, computer makes it easier to do that. But do you actually know how to do that? And so that was a problem back in the early 2000s with young people saying, well, the computer, I, I can just do the computer. So it's, well, no, you still have to know how to do this. Yeah. So. Well, and, and I was using it the same way you were in those early days on the Wacom tablet yeah. and with Fractal Painter was yeah. way early. Um, but I would go and the people that were the naysayers at the studio about computers, uh, I would go take like John Musker, I would show him and he'd go, oh, that's a pretty watercolor. And I go, computer. But it was my <laughs> hand. Every every line was my it was hand doing it. It's hard to take that. They, they couldn't believe that it could be. And I would show people stuff that I had done. I worked on fairies for so many years. Yep. they no, you you scan that in. And then you put some filters. You know, it's, it's funny. I I love because I would see your pastels and then see your digital pastels, and it's all you. It's all me. So I do understand with AI. Mm -hmm. So if, if those assurances that I'm still yeah. me, that I'm still guiding whatever is happening, then I'm cool with that. Well, I would love an, a, like an animator to do a, their specific take on a character. And instead of saying, well, you push a button, it's going to happen. It's like, no, I really like the way you animated it or Glenn, like I, I want Glenn Keen to train a character. So I want him to go into the tool and I want him to know that it's going to be procedurally used for real-time conversations, that the character he brought alive could be talking with people, right? So for, for me to feel Glenn is in it and for Glenn to create one character, so it's not just a generic character, it has a certain personality. It's shy or it's rambunctious or whatever, and he's made it come alive, but he's done enough work that it goes into the procedural engine and then he can deploy that to have like 10,000 real-time conversations with people tonight. Like that's not robbing him of work. He didn't used to even have the option of having one real-time conversation. So now to say like this is all new territory, it's a new stage to play on. We're celebrating your style and your character and you're gonna get attribution and payment for it. Um, now it's, it's a new territory to go play in. Did we have something in the chat? Uh, from Asifa Hollywood, uh, Adobe is collecting images as well. I just read an article about a German photographer who sent a, ce a cease and desist to a company scraping his images. Uh, they dismissed him and sent a bill for legal fees. Yeah. That's not cool. yeah. 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 I, I just want to throw in a little, a, a little history thing too, and you talked about that. You know, I like history. Uh, uh, but, but, uh, but uh, there was the Hungarian artist, Peter Foles, who was working uh, at the National Film Board. He did one of the very earliest CG films called Hunger in, in 1972 or 74, I think. And and as a fine artist, he was attacked by other fine artists for like, why are you, bast why are you bastardizing, you know, your, your art by by using machine? And, and his argument was great. He said, he said, you know, the artists of the Renaissance ground their own pigment in mortars with egg white, <laughs> you know, and alcohol, yeah. you know, and he says the impressionists, oh, oh yeah, and they made brushes with horse hair tied to a stick, you know, like if you were an assistant, your first job was to make brushes and pencils mm -hmm. for your master, you know, he says the impressionists bought their two, uh, bought their paint in tubes and bought stretchers and canvas. So you mean they're not artists because yeah. they didn't grind their own paint? Mm -hmm. He goes, so I'm using a computer. Mm -hmm. I'm not using paint. Mm -hmm. It's still art. Yep. Yeah. I'd like to talk about like that in terms of tech as well, because I think that's a great point. We often have this conversation in my department about do we teach them to model, right? Or each individual piece or what is cheating? But we're using game engines, right? So what do we, do we have to write the original code? At what point is it a level of originality and which is it that we're reusing things that have kind of come before? And so I, I think that's just something to, to throw in and conceptualize on top of the fact that Art is evolving, but technology, we're just kind of compounding on top of it. I, I have a comment on, that, on the, uh, this idea of unexpected creativity. By the way, I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself earlier. I, I 
Thank you, Lee Crow, for sort of telling a little bit about me. My name is Bill Croyer. I'm a former animation director. I was uh, governor of the academy and uh, a few other things, but I've uh, been involved with technology kind of since the beginning. And I'll tell you one of my favorite stories about accidental uh, creativity. I know how many of you are familiar with Massive, the program that they use for animating crowds and Lord of the Rings and all these other movies, but there's a very famous incident where they first started using Massive. You know, the way they did it was they would take individual warriors and they would motion capture 50 or 60 motions, every possible thrust and parry and movement that a warrior would do. And then they programmed that intelligently so that those warriors would interact with each other in believable ways. They did this. And when they ran the program of the big battle, there were a group of about 20 warriors over in the corner of the screen that got surrounded by the enemy and they turned and ran. <laughs> And the programmers never program them to do that. Oh, yeah. There's some reason these guys just behave that way as an accumulation of all the other things that they were taught. So that is going to be one of the inevitable results yeah. of using AI in any process. You know, we've all had the experience animating a scene where you discover something in the process of animation. You didn't start in the scene doing it, but it came to you and you're, it's the happy accident and it makes the scene great. That's going to happen with AI, you know? So there was a comment earlier about taking ownership and, you know, you want it to be your own. As soon as you start getting these processes involved, it's very likely they're going to do things that you didn't expect and you didn't even think of in program, but they're probably going to be good. And yet, and there again, we're going to want to embrace those for the audience's sake. We're going to embrace the fact that happened. And again, that's going to be another one of these challenges. When I said before, the challenge about AI is, is very, is you have to get into the very specifics. And that is if there is a need to protect uh, against thievery, against copying, that's really what it is. But I think that the, the flip side of that is, is you're just going to see this, you know, these happy accidents happen that are just going to, you know, create entertainment. Yeah. Right. The whole theory of plussing that we used to embrace coming right out of school, <clears throat> find ways to plus things. And then I think a, a bit of irony that comes out of it is there's more automation and things are scraped from larger, larger data sets that everything starts to look the same. So then everything that's unique starts to stand out. So if you're so dependent upon using AI, going to, to your point back there is if, if you know when to use the tool or how to use the tool to go plus the next step versus I'm just depending on it and I can only do it with that, um, you're not going to stand out. So you're not going to be able to do it. So yes, special. the individual really will stand out. Mm -hmm. And you just look at this room, we're all absolutely eccentric individuals, <laughs> one of us, and we're used to that. And so I think in the sea of sameness out there, people are going to get really bored with that. Mm -hmm. Even if characters look different, but they move the same, there's just something that feels wrong about that. So there's a bunch of us that are trying to get individuality pushed back into it. And so even in the game universe where you have to have procedurally like do a different path, mm -hmm. it's like, but do it as that one character, how they would do it. And we're trying to do with, with AI, you know, conversational AI, I'm, I'm into it with the enrolled AI people, uh, John Gaeta, who's the chief creative officer there, set up XLab for, for Lucas before that. Um, uh, a goal that we'd love to get into is to have a character do active listening. Um, so that the challenge is it's not giving me any text or voice back. I'm just telling them a story. And there's like three of them sitting around a campfire. And one of them is really into what I'm saying because that's its personality. And it's like, can't wait to hear the next thing. And it's scared when something bad happens. And it's so happy when it's something good happens. That the character sitting next to it is just bored out of its mind because it doesn't want to hear my stupid story again. And the one next to it is like finding entertainment by trying to burn the marshmallow, the one that's sitting in the fire and like trying to <laughs> cut smart marshmallow into the fire. And when it catches on fire, it's happy. So, you know, to just go, they're not spitting any text out, but the system, you should be able to train it so that, and, and have that that's actors and it's animators and it's performance and it's writers like crafting those individual characters so that they aren't lost in that soup of sameness. And they stand, even when they're just listening to you, you can tell they're alive and they're listening and they're individuals. So we have uh, Floyd Norman here who, um, I'm going to put you on the spot, um, <laughs> who started animating at Disney in 1956. 56. Six. You're silent, dear. 
And I was wondering <laughs> if you had any uh, comments about this as the, the old man on the mountain <laughs> that we all look up to. <laughs> so, yeah, all I know is that uh, back, I think, I think the year was 2000. And I had just gotten back from Pixar. I had been up working with Pete Doctor on Monsters Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in a room with uh, three other guys. And this is like animation past, present, and future. In that room with me, I don't know how I happened to be in that room. Joe Grant, mm -hmm. Roy Edward Disney, yep. and Steve Jobs. Yep. All talking <laughs> about animation. And I said... Oh man, if I could only record this conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, but I knew that I didn't know where we were headed at that point, but I knew we were headed somewhere, and chances are it was going to be good. So, you know, you just have to uh, embrace the future wherever it takes you. Mm -hmm. You've always been very adaptable. So that's why I wanted to hear. That's called staying employed. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the one thing that AI can't scrape is something that's never existed before. That is never, it is not online. And that means that's your personal experience. And, you know, Brad Bird had a very famous quote a few years ago saying that, you know, when we were young, we didn't have access to every film ever made, but young animators do. You can go online, you can go on YouTube, you can go everywhere. You can pretty much watch everything that's been done, everything good that's been done. And the danger of that is that you start to repeat that, you know, that becomes your resource. That becomes what you think that's the way it should be done because that would have been done. And I think that's in a way, one of the biggest challenges to the industry right now is I see that so much in character performances and in story, as I just keep seeing stuff I've seen. And uh, we just keep urging people, you know, try to take things from your own personal experience. Your own, you know, the whole thing about being sincere, sincerity is your own, it's coming from you. It's not coming from an imitation of what you've seen. I think that in some ways that'll be one of the great protections against the AI scraping is just if it's coming from you originally, then it it, it has not been copied. Yeah, I uh, I remember the veterans used to tell us when we came in, we're we're flattered and uh, you know Eric Eric Larson and Frank and Ollie and and even Milt would say we're flattered that you're going into the archives and you're pulling out our flipping scenes and you're learning from that, but please don't copy our work like we i was when i was looking at my friend and my friend was made me laugh and so i put that in my animation or you know we went out and a storm was happening and so uh you know we looked up in the rain and like woolly Reitherman got out the you know we laid down on the sidewalk to see the lightning and got drenched and yeah. so they'd have these stories from life and they said do the same thing and my wife rebecca who she came from art center into disney and we, we met at disney she's here doing some Counseling, and she asked somebody yesterday, it's, it relates to what you're saying, Bill. She said, you have to, it, it's the equivalent of scraping from real life. She said, have you ever just gone people watching to some to a young person and to just see how people behave and put that in your work? And he went, no. <laughs> and she was like, oh my God, you should just like, you should look around instead of looking at all the other films that have been made, look at people, yeah. look at your life, look at situations. She And she described to this person, uh situation where Rebecca and I had gotten stuck at an airport for several hours longer and we started just watching people and we'd see like the same person go by like six times oh they must be doing loops around it. and then you see somebody who was heading to get something done and somebody who was really bored and somebody that was on the phone and they almost stumble over other people and we were just mesmerized of watching all these people and making up stories about them and figuring out what they were doing and who really lost something bad it was in a, a Vegas airport I was coming back from the convention <laughs> Like who really lost at the tables? <laughs> um, I think you. Yeah, I just wanted. I wanted to agree with Floyd and talking about some of that anxiety that you were talking about because I'm. I, I have broken into the industry, but I'm only slightly older than the student who made the comment. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I would like to be employed for the next few decades, mm -hmm. and I feel like there's different threads at different times. Like right here, we're talking about AI, but in the past years, it was like, oh, all this, the studios are outsourcing. Mm -hmm. But then the reason why I have my job, I'm a color designer at Disney TV, is because for our vendor, we need to do more um, color scripts. Like we're doing color scripts in within color scripts because they're not trained as Disney wants them trained. Mm -hmm. So now there's this job where I'm like doing every frame for them so that they can light it. 
So it's kind of like there's a lot of emphasis on the opportunities that are lost, but not the ones that are going to be new. And I think for you too, like you're working in 2D, like maybe it's like people at this table would have been scared about all the 2D animators losing their jobs, but then what about modeling and rigging and 3D animation, right? So maybe we could have talks with these, like what careers are going to be possible with AI? Well, and there's teams of people writing the, the authoring tool that I'm using to make a character come alive with AI character authoring. There's whole teams of thoughtful people that are working really hard to make the system I'm writing into. Yeah. And so they have long-term jobs that are really important. I'm using it for hours and hours and making a character come alive step by step. So we, you know, it's all very engaged, creative people. Yeah. And we have a responsibility as a community with students to also talk about the new opportunities and things and not yes. just the ones that we're going to lose. Otherwise, that anxiety is real, even well, yeah. for the people who have broken into the industry. But you're like, am I going to have a job? But we probably are because we're all still here. So, you know, let's talk more about that, I, I guess. <laughs> you deserve to be retired, Adrian. No, we got a job for you. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the crazy thing is that, you know, when people are talking about, like, you know, the anxiety that's happening right now in the industry and all, when I was president of the Guild in the 1990s, this was during the animation renaissance, the the, the total membership of 839 was 3,000 members. Now we're in a period of down, uh, uh, you, you know, you know, just anxieties, layoffs, and stuff like that. The membership of 839 is 6,000. So it's like, <laughs> you, know, you know, and growing. Yeah. So it's it's there. Um, just to answer your question, that what are the new animators? It's still always going to be the new AI. And AI because the truth is, AI can take the first, but not the only first. Again, on the non life experience, there are things that you will have experienced that unless you tell the AI about it, it's going to be out. So, in other words, there's a creativity that you're always going to have that is not appropriate. You can experience it first. When I mentioned, you know, working with AI and you can work like set up and we'll generate four images. They say, oh, redo it again, redo it again. First four, fantastic. Next four. Eh. After that, it's like, it's the same thing over and over. And that's really kind of an explanation of what AI is. It's going to hit that wall. It can do variations of itself, but not create new. You as an artist, you can read it, but it's your technique, but it's your approach, your body, that sort of thing. Like that. Can't be thought because it has to be experienced. So, so very important for, I mean, me as somebody who knows how to bring that well, but also for you guys, for, you know, in the industry, getting it right. Like, because how many people are saying my service? It's not a whole lot, right? I can figure out how to bridge that again. What I'm seeing is a lot of the younger generation. Uh, hey, your voice doesn't matter, and that's not like you guys. That's my writing right now. And reminding us, that, you know, yes. showing us that hey, you know how to do this. Yeah, you got this. Yeah, this is why you have value over it. Like that's so important. Well, well, and and I also think that they're going to be able to author and use AI mm -hmm. to make surprising, magical new things mm -hmm. that they'll be proud of. I'm. I had several people gather around last night, and they were. We had had another discussion and they were very excited because they, they felt like for the first time they felt like it was a tool that they could use to expand their own experimentation and artistic statement and career potentials. And they yeah. felt like there was a point where they just saw it as the dark, ominous thing that was approaching. And they went, oh, no, there's a version of it where I take it and I use it and I use it for my own individual voice. Yeah. Yeah. Like, why did you go from working with paper digital? Because I felt I was slowing. Like, I needed to, you know, step up again. Mm -hmm. I think it's very much so, like, us figuring out that that's just part of life. Like, that's part of it. We're going to have to do that no matter what we yeah. But again, really giving us the foundation to say, hey, you have the ability to make this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people are talking right yeah. now. Yeah. So, but the one thing we're going to say is that right now the animation is free. It's based on the version of the Oh, for sure. Yeah. Not only the streaming services, but with the 
celebration of their God. This is the same thing. Think about the music industry. So it was like in the 80s, the 90s, how much it changed when Napster came out mm -hmm. and Spotify and look at the studio system that would have existed. You know, most people are, it's like artists now are not generating albums. They're just releasing um, songs individually, then they'll come together as an album. Mm -hmm. Video games came the same. We were all PC, then all of a sudden we went console and it looked like we stagnated and suddenly the iPad comes out. Mobile comes out and any sort of just blows up. People are creating games, whether individuals or teams of four. Like that, it did, um, started out one guy did that whole game you know, for five years, but he had been some screwed around on Mobile World Trapper 3. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he releases it, and next thing you know, he's this overnight invasion. And he's like, I was living literally off my girlfriend's income. Driving around with a pinno, and I made two points. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that gets to the point of confidence. That's a person that was okay with failing. Mm -hmm. So in the classroom, how many students are okay with failing? I think you're terrified of it. Yeah. 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 So it's exactly what you said. Right. Yeah. Third person fails. That's the best one. That's the best teacher. That is the best teacher, but. When we're trying to work for generation that goes, if I get an A minus, it's a C. If I get a B, it's B minus, if it's C. Yeah. The idea of learning from the happy accident, if AI generates the happy accident, oh man, shit, that's not what I want. I learn what AI can figure out. You figure out what AI actually learn. Once it's it's available, twice it's available, it's available three times, I can figure something out. So, add, right? so how how do we make sure we build into the conversation in the classroom that you falling on your knees, falling on your face today was not a bad thing? Confidence only comes from standing up, and and I think there's something to be said for straight into it. It's like if the classroom is like a sandbox, just make a mess. It's okay, make a mess, and that voice. Finding your voice, that's something like I emphasize to my students, you don't have to be a cookie cutter. You know, this is not a cookie cutter environment. Everybody here has a voice and it's art. We are artists and no one can take that away from you. Um, so I remember I was thinking about growing up with Legos and it was just a bunch of little blocks that I would put together. Now I see Legos build this exactly you know step by step like this is how you build this buy this to create something and i'm like it, it's you know the, the confidence it's like empowering students to be able to make whatever they want it doesn't have to be this exact thing that is prepackaged that you have to fit this cookie cutter you know and it's no one can take that away from them it their voice if they have that opportunity to express it. So I feel that, you know, that kind of a classroom, I think, can help um, just supporting that. What you said about making a mess. Yeah. In the, in the 1990s, the Disney story rooms were almost pristine. Mm -hmm. Up at Pixar, our story rooms were a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> a mess. Who made the better pictures? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember one of the first things Eric Larson drummed into my head when I was 16 yeah. was, where's your roughs? Yeah. I, and I didn't know. I came in trying to do the pretty perfect thing, yeah, trying to right. be the some person who made no mistakes, like you're yeah. saying. Um, he, he said, no, that's not how we got there. We got there by doing roughs and trying things and making mistakes. Like he said, if you do a pretty, if you start with a pretty drawing, you're going to fall in love with what's probably a bad idea. <laughs> it's like, he said, it's better to do like, like do something that you have no investment in like super roughs and try like 20 ideas. And there's gonna be like 18 of them are bad ideas and two are pretty good and one is your favorite one. Now make it pretty. But it's like the mess, the rough is where you find your voice. And then once you find your voice, now you can kind of hone it and make it prettier. Well, uh, which is, you know, every artist has a thousand bad yeah. <laughs> Start getting them out. Start getting them out. <laughs>
Yes. Okay. We, we just need to check in on our time. We only have the room for eight more minutes. So if Uh-oh. there's any uh, uh, closing thoughts. Uh, well, I just wanted to, to speak on your point about the confidence and then um, helping build that. So something I started doing this semester with one of my classes uh, based upon information I got last semester is for the first six weeks where I'm teaching character modeling and teaching ZBrush where they're all terrified of because they've never touched it before. I don't give them any feedback on their actual, on like what they're actually turning in. I just give them freedom and a direction that they need to go. This is what we need for a bust. This is where I want you to take that. It terrifies them. (laughs) And I was like, well, 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 why? Because they're like, what do I need to do to get an A? Turn it in on time and push yourself as far as you can go. That's the grade. They're like, no, 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 no. What do I need? To, like, how do I need to make this look? Push yourself as far as you can go <laughs> with these tools. And I give them constraints. And then we we add a little bit each week. Um, but they're scared. It, it's it's a lot of, and I, I don't know if it's if the reality of it, but I'm like, it's almost like just being taught to the test your entire life. This is what you need to do to get an A. And if you don't do this, then you're just, you're going to fail. Um, so I think that those types of exercises might help push them out of the the shell of, of the constraints of this is what I need to do and allow them to be creative. Um, and I bring up, I actually bring it up the point of, have you all noticed that I haven't given you any feedback? And they're like, yes, why? <laughs> uh, like, because I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to narrow your path. I never That's wanted so- an A. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I never, I never wanted an A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my question is, when did this start? Where kids feel like that? Um, and how long has it been going since they started giving grades? Yeah. 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 I went to Cal State Long Beach at the time when I want to go to pre-production. That was just now started, like mm-hmm. as I was heading up, you know, heading up. Um, I could have gone into the animation program. I applied for it, just did it the first time because there's such a high standard for that that it's almost impossible to even like see that. But then I was thinking I could take lithography, I could take jewelry making, I could take pottery. Did but I put, um, I could take history of printmaking, and I feel like I learned so much more in those classes just because I'm putting my camera off. Mm-hmm. I'm having fun. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I shouldn't do with boy making because my camera gets so set up. Okay. <laughs> I did maybe almost hit somebody with a cord one time. Like, oh. right? <laughs> but also that's me learning. Hey, this is not my strong suit, but yeah. I can still see it. You know, mm-hmm. I can still have fun. I can still create something off them. Um, and I think sometimes encouraging, you know, them to play around in something they're not familiar with. That's, that's really good help too. So. I think we've got one more chat. Oh, no. I'll just answer that. What's the okay. Head? What's the head? Okay. Oh, what's the head? Yeah. I'll do it. I'll keep talking because that's very awkward. Okay. <laughs> I, I was sort of that that that, um, that I think that it, it's important to the development of an artist that at least once in your career you you're told you suck. <laughs> I think it's healthy. It, it's very healthy. Yeah. And so because I do. Yeah. Once. Once. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm being kind. That's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. I would say this is the thing. I never went to art school. I went to, I had art in high school and then I couldn't afford to go to art school. So I basically taught myself and read books and went to galleries and all that stuff. So in a way it was a good thing for me because I didn't have anyone telling me what to do or how I should look at something. Or if I did draw something, they, someone would say that sucks, whatever. Some people did. I mean, I did some pastels. This old man told me I'm doing it wrong and whatever. I don't know what to say about that. But, <laughs> but, but the thing is, is that I'm, in a way I'm happy. I didn't have the anxiety of having to get an A. I mean, that must be really, that it's must be really difficult. Too. It's and, yeah. I mean, yeah, how, yeah. Can you, how can you learn and enjoy if you're so worried about, my parents have paid for this and I got to get this thing and I've got to get this A, or I, I paid for this myself. 
that takes a lot of the enjoyment of what you're doing out of it. And so that must be terrible. Oh my God. And just to answer your question, I saw, I've seen the ramp up in like the last five or six years wow. of oh. being just terrified of, of failing. Um, so you almost have to make them fail. Right. Well, and there's one, there's one thing too that I tell all of my students and like you, I'm completely self-taught. I went to art school, but I didn't know how to animate it, teach myself how to do it. But all of my students now, they're starting to express that anxiety and that fear. That's a real hard life. And if you're not afraid, not anxious, then you're dead. <laughs> you should probably just keep going in that journey. I mean, one of the things is like the students are so worried about grades that what I tend to tell them is like, you know, grades, grades are not going to give you a job. <laughs> right. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. so you should be here to make that amazing mm -hmm. portfolio yeah. because it doesn't matter if you have a diploma from whatever university. Sure. The important thing is the work. And and again, remember the, the the famous motto of no one wants to work with an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Growing up to a student and sharing your own struggle. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, even like sitting here in a drawing class, like you draw for animation, where does things go? There's moments where it's like. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Have these moments when they go, oh, for every 10 drawings or 20 drawings we sit on the board, there might be one school of So again, I'm just stuff, right? So this is how we need to work through it. You know, talking to students about they did this, our first special software department. So it's sort of redefining, we redefine our titles. I'm not your professor. What? <laughs> and you're not students. Who are you? You are artists. And what am I? I'm an artist. I've just been around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the goal in this class is not to figure out how forward so that we can wake up 20 years from now. Still want to make art because that's going to that's what it's going to come down to. Who you read and if anybody is going to go major now or art school and dress mm -hmm. in the mouth, right? <laughs> and, and, a, and a 17 year old put their name on a promissory note because that's what they're freaking out of. They need plus the ROI, they're freaking out closer to get the red race. They go, Oh, yeah, I have to pay that back. Yeah, we want Sally made someone for me. Yeah. And I think reality. that's attached to the great anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so if the imps are to go, okay, in order for this to be sustainable for you, we have to recalibrate that you gotta you have to stop thinking like you're a student in high school or middle school. You're an artist who wants to still be an artist. So mm -hmm. let's talk about how we can make each other better artists. Iron sharp and iron. So instead of Holding back at our critique. Let's not call it a critique. Let's just discuss, like we wouldn't in the other pitch session. Hey, you know what I was thinking? The work here. Yeah, we've got to get them communicating more about how they can be artists. Does anyone show their students like your undergrad work? All the time. The work that you did from when you were. Yeah. 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 Destroyed the fifth? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love it. And they're just like, I lose all respect. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's a wonderful experience. They like, I could do better than that. I'm like, yeah, and I got a job. So what's your problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that usually lowers it it's, slightly. Like, hmm. like, that makes me a whole lot more comfortable. Like, I know, not that it was my conversation. Yeah. Yeah. 
Which is the official and I had one of the producers next to me. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm just saying that just for saying, because we're right at the right at time now, but I just want to throw it really quickly. The great thing about this conversation we're having right now is the reason why the Animation Educators Forum was created. Was what was we were all sitting around, you know, 2007, thinking, you know, when 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 effects guys get together and hang out, they talk shop, and when baseball players sit around, or, you know, out of a game, they talk shop. And I said, we have animation educators all over the country, all over the world, and none of them are talking to one another. And I said, why don't we all get together and talk shop? And that's what this is, and it's beautiful, you know. And I mean, that's what this organization exists for. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Good comment. Just to tag on on yours. I, uh, I hope that teachers are in encouraging students to be individual um, because I think part of the pressure is and I see a lot of people trying to copy the same thing. I see a lot of, of yeah. effort to do sameness yeah. and it's like, look, we can all draw the same style. Um, but if there's celebration of the individual style and you go, that's what makes you an artist is your your filter of the world. It's like you took it in your eyes and your brain and you filtered it out to be unique to you. Mm -hmm. If that's celebrated, then I think the pressure to equal that one thing that we're all copying will be lessened. And it goes back to your thing, if you want the Lego box that says make anything instead of the one that says make this particular Star Wars ship. <laughs> um, I think we have one more comment from a Zoom person. Uh, AnimationEducatorForum.org. Um, the, the person on the camera, I thought he wanted to say something. Yeah, sure. oh, John's just in the middle there. From Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. John, did you want to say something? Maybe. No, I, 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 I'm fine. I was just, I was just enjoying the conversation. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll wrap, we'll wrap it up here. Okay. But we'll have more. Uh, Animation Educators Forum, I think our website is, is it animationeducatorforum.com? Dot org. Dot org. 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 So, all, yeah. All spelled out like that. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, yeah, stay in touch with us. And, yeah, it's, thank you all for being here. What a great conversation. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.